do, I'd like to introduce to you our first guest. He's known as Mr. Alice Cooper's executioner. Let's give a nice round of applause for the fantabulous magician known as Mr. James Randy. And before we introduce our next guest, I've been given permission, I've been given the greatest permission to read an excerpt from the upcoming book, A Magician in the Laboratory, as written by Mr. James. Uh, that's Randy laboratory, himself. not lavatory, in case you're wondering. <laughs> <laughs> laboratory, how's that? Very good. That's All right. <laughs> this is from his words. Years ago, I toured the USA in several foreign markets as part of the Alice Cooper Rock Show the Billion Dollar Babies episode. My job was to chop Coop's head off with a guillotine every single night, hopefully without actually doing him any harm. <laughs> it worked for more than three months, and during that period of time, I had the nightly opportunity of seeing a rather unique phenomenon. Coop and I were always the last to leave the dressing room to begin the show because I had to equip him with two handheld mechanisms that enabled him to throw long flames from his fingertips. These were semi-dangerous, who, who ever heard of semi-dangerous? Semi-dangerous? <laughs> These were semi-dangerous devices which he'd only take into his hands at the very last moment. When the stage manager would poke his head in the door and announce two minutes, I would watch Vincent Funieri. Funier. Funier. Well, close enough. Yeah, him too. <laughs> Coop's original name rapidly and almost magically changed from a reasonably normal young man into the showbiz monster that his audience expected him to be. He adopted the character by simply putting it on like a pullover. His walk, his facial expression, his entire demeanor changed. And a moment later, as he would totter up the stairs, Frankenstein monster-like into the spotlight, Vincent blah, 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 would become... Alice Cooper. Two hours later, when he retired from the stage, dressed in white satin tails and top hat, he again became Vincent as soon as he hit the lights of the dressing room. I always admired that in him, his ability to step into fantasy and then shed it so easily. It's a talent we might all try to acquire. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Fournier, Vincent Damon Fournier. And by the way, Randy actually looked like this in 1976. And I have pictures of him as a baby. He looked just like this. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> My apologies for bastardizing your last name. No, I never okay. studied French. <clears throat> but it's a wonderful name nonetheless. Folks, as you know, like I said once before, this is our Billion Dollar Babies Tour 1973. So this discussion is going to mainly focus on that. I'm sure many of you may have a few questions, but we're going to listen to these gentlemen chat. Uh, and I have, I guess, the start of this question. Mr. Cooper, how in fact did you find this man? Well, you know, the idea was we had already basically decided that rock and roll needed another dimension. And rock and roll didn't have a villain. Rock and roll had, was full of, of heroes, but there was no villain. And um, I would gladly be Captain Hook to the, all the Peter Pans out there. You know, I was, I was born to be the villain. And so we decided that Alice Cooper, I mean, I would definitely be the Basil Rathbone of rock and, rock and roll. And at, when we finally got that, we pretty much alienated every organization in America and uh, thought, let's take it one step further and bring illusion into it now. Uh, the most dangerous thing in the world was to give Alice Cooper money. <laughs> you know, because we were making our own props and we would find things backstage and that would be the prop for the night. We actually had money now because Schools Out did very well. And then all of a sudden Billion Dollar Babies was the number one record and we could afford 
the best guy in the business. So uh, we said, well, let's get Randy and let's start adding illusion to the show. And that's when we came up with the, you know, the guillotine and, and things like that. And uh, I really wasn't, really wasn't uh, willing to put my head in a guillotine without somebody that really knew what they were doing. <laughs> wise, wise decision. Yeah. yeah. I must tell you how I heard about it. I don't know whether you know this uh, story, Coop. Uh, I was in the magic shop, of all places, uh, on 34th Street uh, one afternoon uh, with some of the other magicians sitting around. We were telling one other stories, some of them true. And uh, the phone rang, and the proprietor picked up the phone, answered it, and then he put his hand over the phone, and he said, a, a fellow connected with an Alice Cooper, I hadn't heard the name, frankly, I must admit, I had, and he hadn't heard either. He said, he wants to talk to a magician who will travel with a rock show. And I put up my hand, I said, I'll do it if he pays me $100 just to talk to him. And he went back to the phone, and he said, he'll pay it. $100 at that time was a lot more than $100 today, I can assure you. I got out of there, I burned the stairs as I went down, and I showed up at the Alive Enterprises office. You weren't there. No. And, uh, but Shep was and uh, several other people. I think Joe Gannon might have been there. Joe Gannon, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I noticed something about the decor. This is great. They had potted plants all over the place, all dead. <laughs> this is alive enterprises, remember? And all the potted plants hadn't been watered. They were all dead. I thought that was a good touch. And I said, oh, these are my kind of people, by the way. And they talked to me, and we made a deal. And I ended up working for the Billion Dollar Baby Show. Yeah, he was the perfect, uh, I think the perfect foil for Alice. It was a, uh, you know, it was the first time anybody had seen this kind of a show anyways. So when you're adding another dimension to it, all of a sudden you're, you're distract, you're, you're doing, um, Alice would be over here and Randy would say, now when you go over there, we're going to switch this over here. And, you know, you're, you're misdirecting the audience and it's all stuff that we wanted to do but didn't know how to do. And that's when we brought Randy in. He was the guy that really knew how to do all that stuff. Which, yeah. which, if I could interject, which was an amazing thing about that because this was live. We were, what, back in 73, what, Rosemary's Baby, things of that nature. Right. That kind of horror genre was, you know, uh, uh, movie, uh, special effects, theatrics in that way. This yeah. was live. Could not be messed up, could not be fooled, could not be tricked the whole nine yards. You brought in the amazing Randy to chop your head off and obviously it succeeded because you went on a few other locations after that to carry out those same uh, tricks I do believe. Well, and, and, and every night he would be back the next morning alive and I couldn't figure it out. I chopped his head off. Come on. He doesn't seem to take chopping very seriously. We, we, we did another bit called, um, uh, it was uh, Unfinished Sweet. We, and the story behind this was we would, uh, the guy would go to a dentist office and he would get under gas and he would have this dream that he was a, a uh, super spy. So one guitar would be playing the Man From U.N.C.L.E. theme, one guitar would be playing I Spy and the other thing, the James Bond theme. Now if you put them all together, they actually all work together. But I would be in the dentist chair and Randy would come out as the mad dentist and he had a drill that was bigger than him. And it came down, it was all lit up, and he would start drilling my teeth, and then he would take it down to my crotch and start drilling my crotch. I don't remember rehearsing that part. I no, think that's you, very true, very true. I, I made it up. You in, along, improvised yeah. that part. Yeah. And, and it was, it, you know, when you see film of this right now, it really, it's very vaudevillian. Uh, but that was the charm of it, I think, was the fact that everything was trying to be high tech, and we went back to the vaudevillian kind of attitude exactly. of rock and roll. Exactly. Which, uh, which drew people like, uh, you know, Groucho Marx and uh, Mae West. Groucho Marx would come to the show and bring Mae West, Fred Astaire, Jack Benny, George Burns. They would be standing on the side watching the show. The audience was cringing in horror at what was going on. And they were standing there going, ah, 1923, Gracie and I did that. And I, you know, and Toledo, we were in Toledo and we... Uh, <laughs> Except uh, the snake he had wasn't as big as that snake, but they, they were not in the least bit alarmed at anything we were doing because it was vaudeville to them. They, they grew up in vaudeville. So our show had this vaudevillian flavor to it. It was sort of also like that show that at the carnival that you weren't, didn't want to go to, but you really wanted to go to. You know, there's the big tent, and then there's that show on the right over here that 
that was the creepy kind of really do I want to go in there you know that was our show you know and uh, we did uh, my audience was not the Crosby Stills and Nash audience <laughs> I was in charge of the lunatic fringe which you <laughs> well never mind <laughs> I think you know all about that. So we were we were in charge of all these sort of outcasts and people yeah. that didn't quite fit in, but there were millions of them, you know. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. And, and that you was remember it. Baltimore? Well, I remember Baltimore. It's still there, I think. Uh, yes, I believe so. Yes, but I think this. Uh, if I'm wrong on this, this is uh, the senility creeping in again. But. At, at one point, I remember that Shep called a meeting of us all in, in panic. He said, oh, something really bad has happened. I thought, what now? And uh, you were there, and I think you were a bit puzzled. And he made the announcement. He said that the mayor of Baltimore had given you the key to the city. Do you remember that? Oh, I remember that, yes. yes. And he said, we don't want that. We want the parents to absolutely despise Alice, you see, so that they'll forbid the kids to go, which means the kids have to go. This is a way of forcing the, the audience to be there. And uh, we got over it somehow. Yeah, I don't, we had to insult somebody in order to not get the key to the Something city. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> but we, we managed it. Yeah, we, we went out of our way to not try to get those accolades. You know, they came later on, you know, uh, when you're young and dangerous now, I'm sort of old and treacherous now. Uh, but, and, you know, lovable though. And by doing what you did, by wanting, you know, that type of audience to appreciate that, you know, well, here we are. Well, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and like I said, there, there are millions of you out there. Trust yeah. me. <laughs> and do you remember when you came to me and said that your mother was going to be in the audience? Yeah. Now, this was in Phoenix, was it? No, my no, mother's no. probably the most dangerous person you'll ever meet. You have to understand <laughs> that. You know, I mean, she is, she doesn't flinch at anything. She's just like, you know. Well, Coop came to me and he said, he, he was, he was a little, little worried about it. He said, would you mind sitting with my mother? She'll be in the fourth row. We got reserved seats there. Because she's never really seen the act. She doesn't know what I do. Duh. And I thought, well, this is, this is going to be a shock for this lady. I can, I can assure everybody of that. And he was pretty sure of it, too. I sat with her. And when Coop walked on stage in the torn costume, tearing up a doll or whatever he was doing at that moment, not a chicken, not a chicken, I swear. And his mother sat there and said, oh, Vincent, why is Vincent's costume torn? I can fix that. You know? <laughs> And I just patted her on the arm. I was trying to be very, very soft and gentle with her. And I said, no, this is all part of the act. Wait till you see. And then she started to warm up a little bit, but I had to leave and go and do another part backstage. And when I came back to see her, she was hooping and hollering. She was, she was with it at that point. Sure. She suddenly realized what the gag was yeah. and who you were and what you were doing and why. Yeah, and she was, uh, you know, she was one of those ones that said, you know, not enough blood. <laughs> You know, I was expecting a little more blood than that in the show. Uh, I don't think when the head comes off, the artery shoots out far enough in the audience. My mom and dad both got the show. They, my dad was a pastor. And, you know, he was one of those guys that, uh, uh, as an example, he would, um, he'd be shaving, you know, and I would pick, open the Bible up and I'd say, Ezekiel 3:17. He said, and the Lord says unto me, you know, and he would quote it. I'd say, okay. Um, I, open it up again I'd say okay Matthew uh, 5 12 and he says and Jesus said unto them you know I go, wow this guy's good you know and I say who plays bass for the animals he goes Chaz Chandler <laughs> <laughs> so the guy was really good I mean he and he really liked the music he liked what we were doing he got the fact that I wasn't satanic you know he got the fact that was my sense of humor and I was creating a character that I was going to play um, of course which was misinterpreted by a lot of people but uh uh, it, you know, it, it was funny that my parents, I never had a problem with my parents. I wrote all these songs about parents being the problem, whereas my parents were never the problem. Uh, I had the same thing with Schools Out. I wrote all these songs about, you know, how horrible school was. I was, you know, I was like, I owned my school, you know. Uh, and, you know, I, it was one of those things where, like, uh, I had no problem in school. I had girlfriends doing my homework. I was in a band. I was on the cross-country team. And, you know, I was Mr. Personality, you know. So, you know, 
Yeah, it was funny. I wrote all these things about things that never happened to me. <laughs> and I was invited to uh, Coop's recent birthday party. Shall we name the number? Oh, sure. 60. I was 60. Okay, I, listen, I earned all 64 years. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I was earned invited every to year. the birthday party, and so <clears throat> many old faces were there. It was a wonderful get-together of the old gang. And I met his mother, and I sat with her at a table, and she said, you know, when you joined me in the audience there, I, I didn't know who you were, and I, I didn't know what Vincent was doing up on stage, but you made it very much easier for me. I want to thank you for that. And she remembered the event very, no, she's, very well. No, she's sharp as a tack. My mom is still, again, she's 87, and she's just, you know, uh, as sharp as can be. Someone older than I? Uh, I don't believe yeah, that. I know, I know. I'm only 84. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we were talking about how back then, you were trying to alienate. When we lived in Los Angeles, we got to a point where we were pretty much going to be run out of LA because, uh, you know, it was like we were, people would come to our show just, you know, to leave. <laughs> they would go to the show so they can say they left in the middle of the show, which attracted Zappa. That's what attracted Frank Zappa to us, is, is that. But um, at one point, Chip says, I have this idea. We're going to go on stage in clear plastic suits with nothing on underneath. And I'm going to call the police and get you arrested because it'll be great. It'll be great publicity that Alice Cooper gets arrested. So of course, you know, we're on stage playing. He calls the police, the police show up. By the time we get there now, the clear plastic suits had heated up. <laughs> And you couldn't see anything, because it was all, you know, it was all, you know, like, and the police, I don't see anything wrong with this. We couldn't get arrested. <laughs> we literally understood at that point we could not get arrested in L.A. So we moved to Detroit, you know, but we figured we could get arrested in Detroit. But, but uh, you should tell them the story about uh, when the, the semis didn't arrive with the stage. Oh, man. What, there what was, city was that in? Oh, man, I don't it was, know. It was, was dead the gas, winter. The gas, the gas shortage, right? Did it happen during that time? There was a gas shortage during that time. And well, yeah, I don't know what it was, but the, but the semis, the big trucks, didn't arrive at the stage. The stage was monstrous and beautiful, made out of, what, inch and a half uh, oh, plexiglass? Yeah, and every time you'd step on the, on the, it would light up. I mean, it was yeah, really... Yeah, yeah, uh, it, it was a beautiful stage. I think one of the, the best stages I have ever, certainly the best stage I have ever personally seen in my life. It was so versatile and so electronified. I mean, really, it, it did react. It was like Busby Berkeley, you know, exactly. on... Electrodes, exactly, yeah. and it didn't arrive, and we had to go out in trucks and pick up used Christmas trees, can you imagine, with some tinsel still hanging on them, and arrange them. We only had to do that for one night, but everybody in the crew, myself, everybody, we all went out and picked up old Christmas trees and spray painted them and put them around the stage. I don't think the kids knew the difference. No, it was, you know, I mean, in fact, that's the show I would have wanted to be at because it would have been a one-off show. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of times you had to improvise, you oh, know. Yeah. Uh, one night, you know, the snake was a very big part of the show. I mean, it was only on stage for maybe three, three minutes or so. But I go to get the snake, and I had it in the bathroom. I like to swim at night in the, in the, in the bathtub, and it was gone. And I realized we were in a brand new hotel that didn't have lids on the toilets. So it went down into the toilet, into the plumbing of the hotel. This is a snake this big around. Yeah, yeah. Her name was uh, Yvonne. That Yvonne. was our big snake. Yvonne, Yvonne. the snake, yes. We had Boa Derek. We had uh, Julia Squeezer. Uh, you know, we all, uh, little Boa Peep we had was a smaller one. But this one was our biggest snake, and she's gone. So Randy, all of us are tearing the walls apart okay. in this hotel trying to find the Sorry, snake. nuts. It came up two weeks later in Charlie Pride's toilet. <laughs> Now, I didn't ask Charlie. Charlie was chasing me at the time at the Grammys with an axe, I think he was, you know. And I didn't ask him if he was sitting on the toilet at the time or if he was shaving and just kind of looked over and this snake comes up out of the toilet, you know, like in a horror movie. This snake wouldn't hurt anybody. It was like, you know, it was a gentle giant. But I could imagine if you were sitting on the toilet and this thing came up between your legs, it would get that, your that, attention. That, that would get your attention. It would get your attention. To say yeah. the least, yes, indeed. 
Yeah. But uh, you handling that big snake, you could barely walk when you had that snake this, around your neck. Well, that one was big. She was she was really big, but she was uh, uh, she was probably twelve feet long. At least. Oh yeah, yeah. Sixty pounds, seventy. Yeah. I weighed ninety. <laughs> you know, so the snake weighed as much as I did. And all coiled around you inside, yeah. constantly fighting the snake off. Not not fiercely or anything like that. He was just sort of trying to arrange it so that he could move around and still move his mouth. Yeah, you know? this thing was huge. It was really a, really a big snake. But, um, you know, the snake thing was always great. It was always one of those things that... Uh, and everybody finally on the tour got so used to the snake that nobody, even if you had a fear of snakes, you didn't, it didn't bother you anymore, you know. Uh, in fact, the one that I left in here was in the front row on the floor somewhere in there. I don't see it. Oh, here it is. It. <laughs> oh, never mind. Okay. Um, if I could ask a personal question here, and you told me it was pretty okay to, to touch into anything and everything. Um, Mr. Randy, you were originally a Canadian citizen. And At one time, yes. From what I understand, because of this man sitting next to you, I'm, I'm assuming, I'd like to hear you part of it, you have and are now or had been an American citizen due to an incident with the... <laughs> Well, that's the, the Mounties, the Canadian Mounties. Yeah, that, that's the trigger that set it off. We did Niagara Falls. You remember Niagara yes. Falls? Oh, yes. Okay. We had a uh, a large a room full of lockers. It was, I think, the football team's locker room or something, uh, where we could set up the props. And so it was at a school. And uh, I had several parts to play during the show. And. Uh, I did the opening act and whatnot, went to the dressing room and tried to get in. And there was an RCMP, that's Royal Canadian Mounted Police, that's the Canadian equivalent of the FBI, the federal police. And uh, he wanted to know where I was going. I said, into the dressing room, I've got to get my costume changed and I've got to get some props. I was looking a little hesitant at this time, I guess. And uh, he said, okay, and he opened the door and when I walked inside, the RCMP was trashing that locker room. They were very angry because they had come in looking for narcotics, didn't find any, and they decided that they would make a big fuss and they trashed the room. They were taking doors off lockers and, and taking stuff out of the lockers. They had clipped off a lot of the padlocks on the lockers that belonged to the students in the school, to the sports team. And uh, I looked around and I saw that my props were pretty well destroyed and uh, I'd have to improvise somehow. And when I left that room, that's the time when I made a decision saying, what the hell do I need Canada for? You've been very good to me, thank you, but no longer I'm going to become an American citizen. And I set out to do it at that very moment. And I, I never regretted the, uh, the decision. Well, the, the, the odd thing, I guess, at the time was the fact that we had a very good reputation for not being druggies. Exactly. You know, we, were, we drank beer. You know, I mean, that was, we lived on beer, come to think of it, you know. We, we kind of proved that you could live forever on beer if you were in your 20s. Uh, and so we had a very good reputation for never, ever having, uh, and, and the reason was, was because the band that opened for us in 1971 was Cheech and Chong. <laughs> You go over the border with Cheech and Chong in 71. They took everything in our possessions apart. I mean, it was just like unbelievable. And of course, we never had anything, you know. Uh, beer cans is the only thing they could find. And we did finally get a good reputation. Now, I don't know if somebody decided that they were going to make an example out of us in, in Niagara Falls or, or not. But I think after that, we, we just went right through the border back and forth with ever, out, ever changing. Now, it was funny thing was bands like Alice Cooper and Black Sabbath and groups like that, we, we all drank beer. The Mamas and the Papas, James Taylor, the Monkees, you know. All had heavy drug problems. I mean, all the all the all the groups, you know, that were like uh, the squeaky clean sixteen magazine bands were the ones that were all into that stuff. And, and we'd sit there going, ah, I don't want to get involved in that, you know. Or, and and as a, as a layman, as not a, a rock and roll person myself, uh, into this into this ambiance here that I was suddenly plunged into by being hired to chop the man's head off every night and a few other things. Uh, I was very sensitive to that. I thought, oh boy, I bet I'm going to see a lot of dober. I didn't see any trace no. of it whatsoever. Pot, I could smell pot. Most of that was coming from the audience. Oh, yeah. Sure. Yes. No, if you went to Canada, uh, by the third song you're going, I'd kill for a Dorito right now. You know? <laughs> 
You're in the middle of a song and you're going, does anybody have any Oreos? You're dying up here. All you had to do was breathe. I don't know what the big deal was at the border because once you got over there, it was everywhere, you know. Yeah, I mean, oh yeah. Uh, so, but, but anyways, that was really, that, that was the, uh, the peak of our drug existence was that, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, drugs for me are like, you know, Sinex. <laughs> you know, Pepsi AC. Can I, can I have a scenario? Yeah, hey, you want yeah, some yeah, of this? Yeah. yeah, this is really good stuff. <laughs> yeah, I got thank this you. One. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, uh, by the way, I don't think the monkeys were into hard drugs, come to think of it. They were, they were drinkers, too. Um, but, you know, a lot of the really squeaky clean bands that, that, that were, you know, above reproach were all into the hard drugs. And it was just the opposite of what you would think. Yeah, you know. exactly. But Coop had a very good uh, principle, and uh, I was very happy to hear this read right at the very, very first performance. He would carry a can of beer around on the stage usually, but he never took more than one sip out of any open can of beer. It would come open, he would take a sip from it, put it down, a prop man would come and get it and replace it with a fresh can right away because he was deathly afraid, and rightly so, that somebody might drop something into that can of beer that could be harmful to him. That was a wise decision. Early in our career, we did shows with the Grateful Dead. <laughs> who felt that it was their obligation to turn everybody on to LSD in 1968. And I mean, I, ever, I, I would sit there with my hand over my beer like this. <laughs> you know, because the last thing you want to do is be on stage as Alice Cooper and then come on to LSD. I mean, that would be the, you're in the guillotine going, wait a minute, what am I doing in here? <laughs> you know? So anyways, we never got into psychedelics, you know, at least I didn't, you know, and uh, our show was crazy enough where you didn't really want to be involved in anything like that. Oh, it would, very true. And I never drank on stage. Uh, when I finally uh, quit drinking, which was like 30 years ago, I, I went in and my psychiatrist said, well, he says, now, he says, how much, uh, how much do you drink on stage? I went, I never drink on stage. I said, oh. He says, well, when you're doing a movie, how much do you drink when you... I said, I, mean, I never drink when I'm acting on the movie. He says, let me get this straight. Alice doesn't drink. I said, yeah. And he says, but you do. <laughs> said, yeah. And he goes, so Alice is not the alcoholic here, is he? <laughs> you know, because I kept blaming everything on Alice, you know, because he was an easy scapegoat. Well, I do it because of Alice, you know. Uh, and I realized that actually uh, Dr. Jekyll was much, much worse than Mr. Hyde. <laughs> and uh, that, that's when I really realized that when I did work, I was never drunk. Or I had to actually make it look like I was drunk because people wanted me to look like that. You know, but I, I never drank when I was actually working, performing. It was the other 22 hours, you know, that... that uh, so, I mean, that, that was a revelation to me, uh, you know. And do you, do you remember when we hit... Uh uh, what, what was it? Not, it wasn't Phoenix, no, it was, um, uh, I'm sorry, you'll, you'll come up with the city in a moment for me when you realize what I'm about to say. Uh, I, we checked into a hotel and uh, I went out on the balcony at the back, had a beautiful view of the parking lot, and I looked over to the adjacent balcony and here's Coop standing there. And Coop points down into the parking lot and says, what the hell is that? A big white bam with a with a, a jet motor on the top of it, yeah. like from an Electra plane, and it had written on the side of it, now there'd be some recognition here, I think, Domesticon was written down the side of it in big black letters, and I said, I don't know, and he said, no, I don't know either, what is it? It's a weird device anyway. So we retired, went to bed. The next morning, I was supposed to be in Time magazine, that was a Monday morning, and Time magazine comes out on the stands on a Monday morning, and I was down at the newsstand, and I said, is Time magazine out yet? And the lady at the counter said, uh, no, not yet, but this gentleman is waiting for it too, and I looked over, and here is um, Woody Allen uh, standing there, and I had met him before, I went over and reintroduced myself, and he remembered me vaguely, I'm sure. And uh, he said, what are you doing in the, in the hotel there? And I said, well, I'm the Al Scooper group. He said, is, is Alice in the, in the hotel? And I, I said, yeah. And I took a piece of paper and I said, this is secret. And I wrote down your room number and gave it to him. Later on that night, when I walked into the arena, 
he comes rushing over to me and says, you sent Woody Allen to my room. And I thought, I'm going to get it now. And he said, oh, wonderful. He embraced me and he said, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. I'm in his new movie. <laughs> and he is in Sleeper. Yes. Sleeper, he, he's standing at the side of the highway, not in makeup or anything like that, and he's just standing hitching a ride from the Domesticon. That was the, 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 the big white van that contained the servants that had the thing plugged into their mouth and whatnot. Uh, you may remember it if you remember the movie Sleeper. They're all going to go and order copies of it right now, of course. And uh, that's where they had the McDonald's sign where it said, uh, so many sold, and the figure went all the way down along the desert and up <laughs> into infinity. Uh, it was zero, zero, zero all the way along it. And uh, so you actually got into the movie. You yeah, Woody, Woody was yeah. actually, uh, um, uh, I was a reference in two or three movies, in Annie Hall. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he had a joke about me in Annie Hall, and there was another one in Celebrity, where he was talking about this rock star that had snakes up in the room and everything like that. So there was a, there was a little bit of a, I was a big Woody Allen fan. I thought, all you know, take the money and run. Well, was that the, the first movies. time that you met Woody Allen? No, uh, no. Actually, it was. It yeah. was. But I, uh, you know, uh, living in New York, I'd seen him at Elaine's, you know, and bumped into him a few times. But it was, I didn't really realize that he had, was very, pretty much an Alice Cooper fan. Oh, yes, and, he was. Yeah, so he, it was really nice. He when I, I said that. Yeah, it was, uh, it was uh, he's a unique character. Very, I just saw his new movie. It's, it's actually very good. Well, uh, to Rome with Love or whatever. Oh, it yeah, is. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I kind of wish he'd go back to the, you know, uh, the early Woody Allen movies, I thought those were really, really hysterically funny. in a different funny. phase, I yeah. suppose. Now. Yeah. yeah. But the movies are very clever. They're very good. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. You guys have such incredible chemistry together with each other, and, and yet you've only... Not illegal, either. <laughs> That's just legal well, chemistry. I know. Alcohol only. I got that right. <laughs> already. Um, it, it, but... Basically, Mr. Randy, you've only worked with Mr. Cooper on one tour, which was Billion Dollar Babies, One correct? tour, and I How? say it was 90 days, but it went a bit longer than that because we went to Brazil. Right. And we, I where did we go in Europe? Countries, yeah. Well, we went all over Europe now, but the Brazil trip was, a, this was a good one. Oh, yeah. Okay, so they'd never had a rock concert in Brazil, ever. And we're talking about Rio de Janeiro now, a huge, huge city. Yeah, so we're playing, or Sao Paulo, 38 million people. And Incredible. Alice Cooper shows up down there. 158,000 people indoors. You set a record. The it was largest Guinness Book indoor of records. Yeah. attendance ever. Guinness Book of Records is, you know, they had a place that was eight times the size of Madison Square Garden. Now you couldn't see the end of it, could you? You couldn't, with binoculars, you couldn't see the end. Now, if you take 158,000 Brazilians and they all go, <laughs> at once, it's deafening. 158,000 drunk, stoned Brazilians at the top of their lungs, and I'm standing this close to a wall of amps the size of this wall. I can't hear a thing. Yeah. Uh, and the thing that I remember most about it, the next morning, I get up and there's the newspaper, front page, the whole picture, and it's a picture of me with a snake around and the sword and the blood and everything, and it just says, Macumba. <laughs> Because you realize that. that 70 or 80 percent of people under the equator believe in Macumba, which is a, a, a little bit of voodoo, Catholicism, this, that, and that. And so I walked down the street, and people were like, you know, hiding their children. <laughs> kind of good, you know. I started going. Uh. You, you had to be. <laughs> <laughs> you know. He enjoyed every minute of yeah, it. I, I was. You, yes. I was a Macumba god, you know. <laughs> and you know, it was, it was really a great kind of feeling that you know people were like shunning like that and I, I said this I love being the villain this is that even fed my villainous uh, uh, appetite even better but I'm so. sure you remember that the stage was very very high yeah very high and it was so it was so high that we almost had a disaster there the crowd this mass of people was all pushing in they're all standing you see there are no chairs for them standing and they were we had to reach down and the roadies had to hold us by the ankles and watch out when they could to haul the kids up because they were getting crushed yeah. by the crowd behind them they could have died yeah it was well the way there were three births during the concert and you're not responsible for any no, of those. I'm not no. responsible for any okay. of those. I think there were three people died of old age. <laughs> uh, it, there was, it was a city, 158,000 yeah. people in a yeah. city. So it was like, you know, what would happen at a city? So when you looked at that crowd, it, was, it just went off to the horizon in this huge, yeah. it was a monstrous building. And it was though. indoors. It wasn't the biggest outdoor, but it was the biggest indoor audience. Now, Kiss yeah. came in after that and did 144. So we still have the record. 
We I still have the record. Tell That's me good. the story. I, I, I don't have many of the details. Where Shep, Shep Gordon used some ingenious stuff. We, we all know that. He used really ingenious ways in and out of problems of all kinds. And I think when we were in Holland, I, my memory doesn't serve me well in this respect, and we knew that the count of heads was wrong. And there were some 8 by 10 cameras there that took pictures of the audience. And Shep held up the show until they had prints and could put pinholes through every head in the audience, every face that we could see there, counting them up as we went along. And we had been shortchanged by something like 30% yeah, uh, on the, like the head count in the audience. But that's how Shep Gordon thought. Yeah. He thought so well, so efficiently. Well, you know, he was he's still my manager. 43 years later, Shep and I are still together. Uh, we don't have a contract with each other. We've never had a, you know, it's all been on a handshake. Mm -hmm. So Shep is still, you know, blasting away, putting the new show together right now, actually, in, in Hawaii. And um, uh, so uh, I, the, one of the f strangest things that happened early, early on in the career was the Toronto show with the chicken, okay? <laughs> now, we had no idea. This was just going to be a big hundred and I think there was maybe 100,000 people in Toronto. I was going to go on between the doors and John Lennon, John and Yoko. And Shep put this whole thing together for these Canadian guys, and they were going to pay him. And he said, I don't want to be paid. I want Alice to go on between these two acts at the prime time. That was, my, that was his payment. That's how managers think, you know. Good managers. So, yeah. So we're up there on stage. And at the very end of our show, we used to open pillows up. A feather pillow. A fe one feather pillow would fill this room with CO2 oh, yeah. cartridges. It would look like a snowstorm. We had five. Feather pillows up there, and they're like, and, and Jim Morrison's over here in the doors, and they're going, Yeah, this is great. John Lennon's going, Yes, this is wonderful. And I all of a sudden I look down, and there's a chicken on stage, and I went, Well, I didn't bring it, <laughs> you know. Um, it's appropriate because it's a white chicken, and you know, being from Detroit, I had never been on a farm in my life, you know. I figured, Well, it's got wings, it's got feathers. It should fly, you know? <laughs> so I picked it up nicely and just kind of chucked it into the audience. I figured, well, somebody's going to get a great souvenir. <laughs> now, they didn't, they don't fly as much as they plummet <laughs> into the audience. And the audience tears it to pieces. This was called the Toronto Peace Festival. <laughs> a piece of this, a piece of that, a little piece of this. And they throw the rest of it back on stage. Now it's this mutilated chicken, you know. Next day in the paper, of course, Alice Cooper kills chicken and drinks blood and blah, 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 you know. And if you saw Alice, you would go, oh, okay, I believe that. You know, because I mean, you would, you would see this character and think, well, that's what happened. Um, the kicker to the story is the first five rows were all in wheelchairs. Oh, yes. So it was the people in wheelchairs that killed the chicken. To this day, I'm thinking, let's take it back to the basics. Let me see, I got my keys, I got my wall, I got my tickets, got my chicken. <laughs> Who brings a chicken to an Alice Cooper concert, you know? And then I thought the only person that could have brought the chicken is Shep, knowing this was going to happen. You know, knowing that it was going to, you know, Frank Zappa called me the next day and said, did you kill a chicken on stage last night? And I went, no. And he said, well, don't tell anybody, they love it. I went, okay. You know, next thing when people would say, did you kill a chicken? I went, no, I don't want to talk about that. You know, so, <laughs> so. And to this day, I go into a city, and it's the ASPCA is there. Are you going to kill chickens? <laughs> I, don't wanna, I went, no, I'm not going to kill a chicken. I, and in the reality, I never would kill any animal ever. You know, but that was the reputation we got then. To this day, of chicken, they never mentioned Colonel Sanders. <laughs> no. Who was like killed billions of chickens. <laughs> you know, one chicken. You know, it's, it's like, you know, eat one missionary and you're a cannibal, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and not a very smart chicken. The rest of your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh my God, what the hell am I here for? Anyway, um, we can segue into more blood and guts and, and that kind of uh, carnage. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Randy, can you explain to me how you came up with the idea of the guillotine? And in fact, oh. how did you set up Mr. Cooper to have his head removed? 
every concert? Well, first of all, uh, the guillotine was, uh, that's the French pronunciation, you see. <coughs> Founé. The, the guillotine, <laughs> yes. The uh, guillotine was invented by a man named uh, Guillotine. <laughs> Figures, doesn't it? Uh, in France many, many years ago, before the French Revolution, and it was used to uh, decapitate uh, uh, sheep and such. A, a very small one, of course, you see. And it was later adopted by the revolutionaries. It sounded a very good way to chop off the heads of aristocrats. But um, the guillotine uh, trick that I used was not designed by me. I've never taken credit for that. It was designed by a fellow named Will Rock, R-O-C-K. Uh, an ancient magician who uh, came up with an idea of how to do the thing in such a way that the head that fell into the basket was the head of the artist, actually, and that's what it was. It's a damn clever idea. I'm not going to go into any more details on that. You'll just have to wonder about it. And uh, you'll look it up on Google and you'll probably find it, but it'll probably be a lie. I'll warn you in advance. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> One. I've never seen a one. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, you know, can you imagine now, I'm coming to rehearsal, and I, don't, I think everybody kind of just kept it from me, the whole idea, you know. And I get there, and I look over at that, and I went, what is, uh, what is that? You know, it's a, oh, it's a guillotine. Uh, oh. yeah, funny you should ask. And, you know, I'm not stupid. My brain's going click, click, click. I may be drunk, but I wasn't stupid, you know. And it's so, yeah. Okay. In a previous year, you had been hanged. I'd been hanged, but I'd never yes. been guillotined, you know. And, of course, I'm looking at the blade, and I go, well, it's foam rubber, you know. <laughs> no, it's a 40-pound blade. And I take a piece of paper, and I go, shh. <laughs> okay. So it's a real guillotine. Because with a dull blade, you'd suffer, you see. Yeah, but that's it. Uh, if it was going to cut my head off, it was going to be, you know, if you were at that concert, you got to see it. Oh, yeah. Right? Um, and he's explaining to me how it works, and I'm going, <laughs> what? I'm not putting my head in there, you know? <laughs> Pretty soon they got me to put my head in. They showed me how the device worked, you know, and I went, so if I do this wrong, I, my head comes off. For real. Yeah. And I went, okay. I just said maybe. In every bit that we did, there was an element of danger. There was actually a, a moment, if you were in the wrong place at the wrong time, where you could be decapitated. Or you could be hung. If the device didn't work correctly, if this didn't work, the rope was going to go around my neck, and I was, I was taught, my hands were tied. I like the idea that that was part of it. I like the idea that when I went to the circus, when the guy was on the trapeze up there, and I looked down, I went, if he misses, he's going to, he's going to die. The, I like the element of that in it. I wanted the audience to be part of, of knowing that this is... It could be fatal. Well, I've got a wonderful souvenir at home. It's a picture of me dressed in a poncho. Uh, a, a Mexican... No, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm trying to get this stuff out of the way. You're, you're, you're working for me, but no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Something to show you. Um, with, with Dressed in the poncho, I was at the place where the artist made your head. Yeah. And you had to have... What, what did they use? In a no, they had to do, I had to do the cast, you know. They, in those days, you had to actually do, it's the most claustrophobic thing you'll ever do in your life, where they actually have to make a cast of your head, so all your senses are cu cut off for about 10 minutes. Yeah, and it feels, I, I, I've gone through the procedure, and it's not a lot of fun. But I have a surprise for you, Coop. <laughs> oh, no. I have the original Alice Cooper head that was cast at that time. And there wow. it is, ladies and gentlemen. It's in plastic. We got a hole in the back of it. Yeah, when I get shot. We were having a fight over it, okay. of course, yes. But this is the original Alice Cooper head. And from uh, from this one, the other ones were molded. Right. How many did you make? All they, they had to make uh, five or six of them. And with the one we use now is still from that cast. Is it? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So you hold on to that. Yeah. 
But uh, I'm going to ask you to autograph this. Oh, absolutely. Uh, when the time yeah, comes. Yeah. We, we need a special autographing pen for this, of course. Yeah. And this is the original, the very first one. I wasn't there when the thing was being cast on, on, your, on your face, but I was there when they were finishing it off afterwards. And uh, I've still got a couple of souvenir pictures of that that are mementos of my, my wasted youth. Let's put it that way. <laughs> But that is the original, ladies and gentlemen. That the is makeup amazing. isn't too. I didn't great. know you had that. That's great. No, I didn't put that makeup on. Yeah. Someone else did. So yeah. there you go. That's very really good. You know, I think I got to tell you a great story about Randy. Uh oh. Randy is carries a check in his wallet. He used to. Do you have it now? No, I don't carry the check anymore because uh, we don't do business that way. That's they old take fact. credit now. That's what? what old folks would do. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. To debunk anybody that could prove that Uri Geller could was psychic. <laughs> or any psychic is any psychic for that matter, yeah. Uri Geller happened to be the guy, the hot guy at the time. At the time. Yeah. It was really a unique thing because everybody was into psychics, everybody wa wanted to believe in this, and here was Randy going against the flow, going, no. He says, uh, you got to prove that to me. Well, at our display, uh, display table outside, we actually have million dollar checks signed by me, but it says right there in small type that this is not a valid check for, right, et cetera, et cetera. But there was a time when you did have a check that was... Oh yeah, I had $10,000. $10,000. dollars $10, check, and that was the initial, I would sacrifice that immediately if somebody did something really psychic. Yeah, that's, that's an amazing thing, you know, that, that, that somebody would go against the flow of everybody wanting to believe in this to go the other way. Well, well the, the thing is, these so-called psychics are doing a lot of damage to a younger generation. They're getting them thinking in the wrong way. I don't deny that there are psychic phenomena, ha phenomena pardon me, happening. I don't deny that because I can't prove a negative of that sort. But I offer the million dollars, it's not mine, it belongs to the foundation that I represent. A million dollars is a huge carrot to hang out there, even in today's inflation. Uh, it still is a good sum of money to offer as a prize to anyone who can prove that they have psychic powers. They should be lined up outside this hotel right now waiting to claim the million dollars because there are tens of thousands of them all over the world. We get applications for it all the time, but the only applications that come in are not from Murray Geller or, or uh, Sylvia Brown or other people like their John Edward. None of these people, they have, don't apply for it. They say, oh, I'm not interested. They're very interested in a million dollars, and particularly to make me look like some sort of a fool. But the ones we get them from are from people who genuinely believe they have psychic powers. And we test them uh, every year in Las Vegas and all the way through the year and around the world through other experts, other scientists who can handle that sort of thing for us. And I never sit in on it. You know why? Because, because the psychics have adopted uh, an attitude not no, if James Randi is there, he'll put out negative vibrations, so I can't be psychic. Duh! So, when I did a test with the BBC for homeopathy, they said, well, we'll, we'll call you in. I said, no, 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 I want you to 48 hours after the tests are all done, all tabulated in the computer and such, then tell me that the experiment has been done. And that's exactly what they do. And of course, homeopathy didn't work either. But uh, that, 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 that prize, that check, I did carry it around for $10,000. Yeah, for a long time. For a long, um, long time. Now, see, I went to, uh, to, to claim the check because I thought he said psychos. <laughs> And I said, well... And you would have won. I would have won that money. <laughs> Certainly. So I had this great idea, and I was going to bring it to you for a reality show about when they were trying to catch Bin Laden. I said, why don't they put 10 psychics on a helicopter over Afghanistan? And push them up. You know, and... <laughs> no, you just put them up over the... And if they can find a little girl buried, you know, in Idaho behind a barn by looking at a dress or something, and I'm going, why can't they find this guy? So I said, put these guys on there, the 10 top psychics, put them over Afghanistan. And the guy, it, the guy that comes up with the least each week gets voted off the helicopter, you know. <laughs> he said, don't worry, you should have known this was coming. Number seven, you know. number seven, stand, step forward, please, over to the door. <laughs> so, and if you win, it's $25 million. I mean, you catch the guy. 
We're going to get twenty-five million. Well, they were going to. We were going to pay twenty-five million dollars to whoever caught Bin Laden, right? Oh, so yeah, said, well, if they do win, it's win-win. Of course, win. of course, of course. We get the guy, right? Yeah, wow. So it, it it never came to fruition. Nobody wanted to do it. It was. But I was going to call you and say I was going to put you in charge of this. Oh, thank you. Because you would have been perfect for them. Yeah, think of the mail I'd get. Oh yeah. boy. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the close of our panel. I know it's only been. Yeah, I know we have to do this. I'm so sorry, but on a good note. Uh, immediately following this panel, uh, Mr. Cooper will be doing autographs at 6 p.m., not immediately following this panel, but at 6 p.m. in room 208 in the Hilton. Room 208. Wait, wait, 208. Yeah, you knew that was coming. Getting something yeah, okay. there for I'll make a note for you. <laughs> room 208 in the Hilton, uh, actually all weekend long. Um, Mr. Randy will be everywhere. Um, <laughs> I, I just don't know much of what to say about you two. You guys have been fantabulous, incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much. You gel so well together. So without any further ado, this is only Friday. It's only the first day. You will see these gentlemen all weekend long. Ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Mr. James Randy and Mr. Alex.